All right. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Brittany. I'm here on behalf of the National Marine Mammal Foundation. We are a 501c nonprofit located in San Diego, California, and our mission is to improve and protect life for marine mammals, humans, and our shared oceans through science, service, and education. So here we are doing two of those three things. We are communicating and educating the science, the wonderful science that we are doing here at the National Marine Mammal Foundation. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you. We actually just started this series a year ago today. So I'm very excited that you are all here to join us. Um, for those of you who have supported us and attended multiple of these, thank you so much for your support. And it is my pleasure now to introduce you to Dr. Barb Linehan, who is a veterinarian and the Deputy Director of Medicine for the National Marine Mammal Foundation. And I'm going to let her take it away. Thanks for joining us. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening to those on other coasts. Thank you so much for that great intro, Brittany. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about basically advances in dolphin cardiology. And so we're just going to focus on the cardi cardiac aspect of some of the work that we've been doing in Barataria Bay, Louisiana, following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill with the help of the Navy dolphins as well. All right, so Brittany already introduced me, but as a little bit more of background, I'm a clinical veterinarian uh, with the National Marine Mammal Foundation and the Deputy Director of Medicine. So my job is kind of twofold, where I get to participate in the healthcare of the Navy's dolphins and sea lions and take great care of them. And then I'm able to utilize that expertise from working with those animals day in and day out and maintaining their healthcare to then apply it towards wild populations and help with research and as well as education and outreach. And so I'm really happy to share this work with you today um, that's been a few years in the making. So as most of you are probably already familiar with, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurred back in 2010 in April. And this was the biggest environmental disaster that has ever occurred in history. And um, so this happened just off the coast of Louisiana and 200 million gallons of oil spilled into the ocean after this oil rig exploded. And oil spilled for 87 days. And just to kind of put that into context, because it's hard to think about such a huge number of oil, a huge number of gallons of oil. What does that actually mean? Well, that is enough oil. The Olympics are coming up, so it's kind of a fitting analogy. That's enough oil to fill 311 Olympic swimming pools. It affected over 70,000 square feet of ocean, which is about the size of Oklahoma. So this is a huge, huge amount of oil. So as you can imagine, the Gulf of Mexico is home to a diverse array of creatures from small fish and birds, sea turtles, all the way up the food chain to mammals, dolphins, and then of course humans who live in the area and work in the area. So an environmental disaster of this scale, of course, caused horrible effects throughout the food chain. A lot of people thought that dolphins, because they're so intelligent, would leave the area when they sensed the oil, but they actually didn't, and people witnessed them swimming through oil slicks. So how can you possibly go about assessing the impacts of an oil spill of this magnitude? And there are a few ways to do it, and putting them all together helps give us a good picture of the environmental impacts from something like this. So one way, which we'll touch on today, to do this is live dolphin health assessments, where you actually go out, get your hands on dolphins, do basically a really quick physical exam, get biologic samples, and then release them. You can also look at stranded animals. So unfortunately, lots and lots of animals died after this oil spill, um, but instead of you know just not being able to learn from them, we were able to get as much information from them as possible by collecting those dead or stranded animals doing full necropsies and getting as much information as possible about the impacts that the oil caused before they died. And then there's also other tools like remote biopsy sampling in which biologists can go on a boat and they can actually shoot a small biopsy dart and target these animals. And then the dart essentially will fall out and can be collected and then you bring that back to the lab and you can actually assess uh, little biopsy specimens. 
as well as observational studies. So this is where our biologists will go out with essentially cameras and binoculars and their own eyeballs and look for animals. And there are certain animals that are known to us based on their dorsal fin shape or based on different ID markings they may have. And so we can try to follow those animals over time and see, for instance, if one was pregnant last year, do we see her this year and does she have a healthy calf? So combining all of these different types of assessments, we can get a better idea of how this environmental disaster or others have impacted a certain population. And so today we'll be talking about specifically the dolphins who live in Veritaria Bay, Louisiana, who were very heavily impacted um, by the oil spill because that's where uh, the bulk of the oil was. They're so close to that area. And so that's where the National Marine Mammal Foundation comes into this picture. So because of the National Marine Mammal Foundation's expertise in cetacean medicine from working with the Navy dolphins day in and day out um, and from previous work, they were called upon back in 2011 to be part of a team to help study how this environmental disaster, how the oil spill impacted the health of those dolphins living in Barataria Bay, Louisiana. And of course, we didn't do this alone. It is a huge undertaking, as you can imagine, to go out in the field, catch wild dolphins in this area, and do a really thorough, really quick workup to learn as much about them as possible in a short amount of time, and to do that efficiently and safely. And so this is just an example. This is a picture of the team that is required for literally just one day of these field work efforts. And of course, we do this over many, many days. And it's not just the foundation. It's a huge collaboration between all these organizations. And it's veterinarians, veterinary technicians, field biologists, uh, animal care and training staff who are experts at gently handling the animals. You name it, there's a whole, whole group of very diverse people who are involved in making this go seamlessly and learn as much from these animals as possible, as efficiently as possible. So over the past 10 years, this uh, team of collaborators um, have has produced a lot of papers, many, many papers, to show all of the deleterious effects the oil spill caused on the dolphins living in Barataria Bay. And the highlights of that are, we know they suffered a huge population decline. It's estimated that 35 to 51% of the population actually died off after the oil spill. So that's a huge impact. They also are suffering from reproductive failure where we're showing they're having fewer and fewer successful births. And studies since the oil spill have shown that we think this is due to poor maternal health. So basically the moms aren't healthy enough themselves to carry babies to term and successfully birth them. In addition, they have lots of pulmonary disease, far more than their other wild counterparts. They have endocrine disease where they have adrenal dysfunction and they're unable to produce a normal stress response as well as immune dysfunction. Basically their immune cells are not functioning the way that they normally should and the way that other dolphin populations do. And so a few years ago, uh, the team noticed that Dr. Cynthia Smith is our head vet for this. And she and her colleagues noticed a few years ago, before my time, um, that a lot of these dolphins actually had heart murmurs. And nobody had noticed this before. And heart murmurs aren't described in the literature in dolphins previously. So the question arose, well, what about cardiac disease? And this is a fair question because it's been shown in the last few years since the oil spill that there is evidence in other species in this area of cardiotoxic effects of Deepwater Horizon oil. And when I say cardiotoxic, that just means that the oil directly impacts the heart cells and causes them to not function correctly. And that leads to basically heart dysfunction, the inability of the heart to act normally. So this has been shown in several species of birds in the Gulf of Mexico, several species of fish, rats in laboratory settings exposed to Deepwater Horizon oil, and even humans. So interestingly and sadly, the humans who live in the proximity to that oil spill and those who helped clean up the oil spill actually have suffered things like heart attacks and ECG abnormalities at a really high rate, much more than the normal human population. Um, and this has been documented even seven years after the spill. So these are long lasting effects. So with the evidence in other species of oil related cardiac disease and plausible pathways for similar effects in cetaceans, meaning we know they're exposed to the oil, we've seen them swimming through it, they can either be ingesting it, 
where they can be inhaling it and also they're getting in, in, in contact with their skin. So there arose a strong need to investigate this possibility. Are dolphins having cardiotoxic effects after being exposed to the oil? And so along comes Team Cardio and I was lucky enough to be part of this team. So Dr. Cynthia Smith is down here on the right in the yellow hat and Dr. Forrest Gomez and they led the charge on this project. And we roped in, so we have dolphin knowledge, but none of us are cardiologists. So we roped in two veterinary cardiologists to combine their cardio knowledge with our dolphin veterinary knowledge um, to make a great team and basically figure out this question. So down here on the left, we have Dr. Sharon Houston and Dr. Adonia Shu, and they're veterinary cardiologists with San Diego Veterinary Cardiology. So they typically examine dogs and cats. And then up here on the top is Veronica Sindejas. She's one of our veterinary technicians and our hospital manager. And she is the person you want running your ultrasound machine and figuring out all of your logistics. And then over here, you have myself and Bridget Flannery. Bridget is a veterinary technician who works with the cardiology team as well. So we formed Team Cardio to try to answer this question. And we really had to go back to the basics before we could say how the oil had impacted dolphin cardiology, there's actually not a lot out there in general on dolphin cardiology. There's a handful of papers, um, but even the things that seem really, really basic weren't out there in the literature yet when we went searching for them. So the first part of our study was auscultation. And when I say auscultation, that just means using a stethoscope to listen to the animals. And in this instance, we're talking about listening to the heart. You can also, of course, listen to lungs. So the first step was to establish an efficient and reproducible in-water cardiac auscultation technique in dolphins. And that is just a fancy way of saying, nobody's established a routine and efficient way that we should listen to dolphin hearts. And that, again, seems really, really basic because it is. And dolphin cardiology is, was just lagging a lot behind other species. So we basically had to do this, this foundation, this groundwork, so that we could make sure we're listening in the same way to all of these animals, whether they're navy dolphins or wild dolphins. And then we wanted to describe the presence and characterization of heart murmurs in both free ranging, the wild dolphins in Barataria Bay and managed dolphins. So in this instance, uh, comparing them to the Navy dolphins. And then we wanted to better characterize the heart murmur etiology using echocardiography, which is just heart ultrasound in free ranging dolphins. So in those Barataria Bay dolphins and Sarasota Bay that I'll touch on in just a second. To back up a step, if you're not familiar with heart murmurs, well, what is a heart murmur? A heart murmur is just an extra sound that's caused by turbulent blood flow. So when you listen to a heart, if you've ever listened to the stethoscope, you typically hear lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. When there's a heart murmur, you hear an extra sound. So it may sound like lub-swish-dub, lub-swish-dub. And that swish is just turbulent blood flow. And there are numerous things that can cause this turbulent blood flow. It's not always a bad thing and it's not always a good thing. So causes of heart murmurs can include things like heart disease or pathological causes that are indicative of actual heart disease. They can also be secondary to systemic disease. Things like anemia and pregnancy can cause heart murmurs. But you can also have innocent or functional or physiologic murmurs, also called benign. Those terms are all pretty synonymous, meaning it's just due to fast blood flow, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. So when you hear a murmur, as I mentioned, you may not be able to tell just by listening to the murmur what is causing it. So the first step is to listen. And if you hear a murmur, you identify where it's where on the body you're hearing it best, you can grade it and you can characterize it. But then to actually figure out where it's coming from, you need echocardiography. And this actually allows you to see the heart in real time using ultrasound and to look at the blood flow. You can look at the valves and see if any are leaky or thickened or look diseased. And you can look at the structure of the heart. Are the wall thicknesses normal? Is it a normal size? And is it functioning correctly? Basically, is it squeezing blood like it should to pump it out to the body? And so this is where the Navy Dolphins came in to help us. So we wanted to make this standardized and efficient technique. So we first 
uh, utilized the Navy dolphins. And 65 dolphins participated in voluntary cardiac auscultation so that we could develop a reliable and efficient method to do this. We then took the method that we had developed and applied it to the wild dolphins. And first we looked in Sarasota Bay, Florida in June of 2018. And there we looked at 19 dolphins and Sarasota Bay is located in Florida and those dolphins are outside the oil spill footprint. So we wanted to be able to compare apples to apples, wild dolphins to wild dolphins, but we wanted dolphins who we know were not exposed to oil. And so that's why we look at Sarasota Bay. The dolphins in that area have been really well studied for many, many years, and they're a fairly well-known healthy population. So they're basically our healthy wild dolphin control. And then we use the same techniques the, month, the next month in Barataria Bay, Louisiana. As I mentioned, that's where the dolphins lived who were heavily exposed to deep water horizon oil following the spill. And there we looked at 34 dolphins. So the technique that we developed here is a picture of the technique with a Navy dolphin. Dolphin. So this is a trained dolphin who has been asked to voluntarily assume a presentation where I can hold her little pectoral flipper here and then with a stethoscope that is wrapped in plastic to help waterproof it, I can listen on her sternum and we standardize six points where we would listen and that's this diagram on the right and we named all of those points. Slightly different in the wild, same technique, same six points. Um, but because these dolphins are not trained, we didn't want to stress them out by putting them on their side. So when they're being gently restrained by these experienced handlers, their blowhole is facing up. And that's the blowhole right here in the middle that's facing up. And so instead of reaching in from the side of the enclosure, we're actually just standing next to them in the water. So you can more easily reach under and access those same points. So same technique, just a little bit of a different presentation of the animal because one is trained and one we're standing next to. So as I mentioned, if we did hear a murmur, we had to characterize it. And we characterize it based on the timing. So when in the cardiac cycle am I hearing it? Typically in systole, but can also be heard in diastole, basically just the different timings of the cardiac cycle. We also grade it. So how loud is the murmur? And this is graded in other animals and in humans on a one to six scale, where one is the quietest murmur that you can barely hear, and six is incredibly loud. You can hear it almost without putting your stethoscope on the chest. And then we would also uh, name the point of maximal intensity or PMI. And that is where of those six points that we standardized, is it the loudest? Where can you hear it the best? So then, as I mentioned, once we heard these, uh, these murmurs, we had to perform echocardiograms to be able to tell what was causing the murmur by looking at the heart itself. And so first, as with the technique for the auscultation, we had to standardize our technique, refine it, become as efficient as possible using the Navy dolphins so that we could then apply that same technique to the wild dolphins. So we assessed the cardiac health and refined the technique with Navy dolphins. And here's a photo where the dolphin is in a, again, voluntary lateral presentation. Cardiologist is standing on a stand next to a trainer here. And she's wearing ultrasound goggles under that hood. So it basically lets her see what's on the ultrasound screen, even in bright daylight and without having to crank her neck around to look at the machine behind her. And then we applied the same technique, basically got really got the methodology down pat so that we could do an entire echocardiogram in about five to seven minutes, looking at all of the different chambers and walls and valves. And we then did this same technique in the free ranging dolphins. So we looked at 17 dolphins in Sarasota, that healthy control population, and 29 dolphins in Barataria, the oil dolphins. Again, similar technique here, but we're standing next to the dolphin in this case. Um, so this is the cardiologist, uh, Dr. Sharon Houston. The machine is back here, but she can see what's on the machine by you wearing goggles that basically extend that display. And she's reaching under in between the two pectoral flippers to gain access to that cardiac window and do the ultrasound. So what did we find? Well, we were actually very surprised that in all three populations that we looked at, the vast majority of the dolphins had heart murmurs. And this was shocking to us because this has never been described before. And you can see across the board, the numbers were pretty similar. So 92% of the Navy dolphins had heart murmurs, 89% of Sarasota Bay dolphins, and 88% of the Barataria Bay dolphins. All of these murmurs were heard in the systolic phase. 
And there was no difference in prevalence between the Sarasota Bay, the healthy wild dolphins, and Barataria Bay, the oiled wild dolphins. And when we lumped Sarasota and Barataria together and just compared navy dolphins to wild dolphins, again, there was no difference. And so this was really surprising to us. We also looked at the point of maximal intensity and how this compared across those three groups. And interestingly, we saw a pattern emerge that almost all of them had a point of maximal intensity in either the left cranial or sternal cranial region. And this will make sense in a second. So using the echocardiogram, that helps to make sense of all of this. Because what we found is that most of the dolphins with murmurs exhibited high outflow track velocities over a velocity of 1.6 meters per second. So we saw that in 95% of the dolphins. And what that means is basically the blood flowing out of the heart was very fast. It was over 1.6 meters per second. And this 1.6 meters per second number is a threshold that is generally accepted in other species like dogs and cats. That's the threshold above which the blood flow is just so fast, you can hear it even if the blood flow is normal and the valves are normal and there's nothing else pathologic causing that. So this chart kind of helped demonstrate that for us, where you can see that these purple dots are wild dolphins that did not have murmurs. And these green and blue dots are the dolphins that did have murmurs. And when we put that 1.6 meter threshold in there, you can see that almost all of the dolphins who had murmurs had blood flow above this threshold. And most of the dolphins where we didn't hear murmurs were below this threshold. So it appears that that threshold that's been described in other species holds true for the dolphins. So using the echocardiogram, we were able to make sure that there was nothing else causing these murmurs. Because of course, as I mentioned earlier, other things can cause murmurs like leaky valves or stenosis, narrowing of different parts of the heart. So we had to make sure that there was nothing else causing the murmurs. And we were able to do that. And basically a couple of animals did have some mildly leaky valves. So in them, we could have attributed their murmurs to that as well. But in almost all of the dolphins, the high velocity blood flow was what was causing the murmur in the absence of any other abnormalities. And so these are what we term innocent flow murmurs, meaning that the blood flow is just so fast, it's above a threshold where it causes a little bit of turbulence and you can hear it, even though there's no other pathologic disease present. And this isn't the first time anyone's described a flow murmur. This is well described in other athletic species to include retired racing greyhounds, heavily trained sled dogs, race horses, and even elite endurance athletes. So even humans who do things like marathons. And really interestingly, in this paper where they talked about the sled dogs, they found that the sled dogs with murmurs tended to perform better than those without murmurs. We thought this was just a fascinating idea. In the dolphins, could murmurs actually be a sign of fitness in these highly athletic animals? And it is logical, right, that dolphins spend a great deal of time swimming and diving in the open ocean. They're very athletic animals. So it makes sense that they have these big athletic hearts that just pump blood so fast we can hear it, kind of like a racehorse. And so this uh, work has been published. It came out in October in Frontiers in Veterinary Science. So if you want more of the nitty gritty and more of the kind of scientific details, um, that paper is out there on the web in Frontiers of Veterinary Science and you're welcome to go find it and read it. But so as a summary for this first part, we were able to describe an efficient technique for in-water dolphin cardiac auscultation. Again, it seems super basic. It seems like we should have done this years ago, but it just hadn't been done before. Early papers that described the dolphin heart actually described it as practically inaudible. So we've come a long way in the last 50 years from saying, don't even bother listening, you can't hear it, to figuring out the most efficient way and actually finding murmurs um, because we were able to make this efficient technique and basically train our ears. We were able to demonstrate that heart murmurs are common in bottlenose dolphins, both under managed care and free ranging. And the majority of these, the vast majority, were innocent flow murmurs due to high velocity blood flow across the outflow tracks. Using the standardized technique, we were able to characterize murmurs previously not described in dolphins. And we suspect that these soft murmurs, a lot of them were really, really subtle. We were probably just missing them before because we weren't listening long enough 
There are lots of environmental factors at play. When you're listening in the water, there's a lot of ambient noise. Sometimes the dolphin is echolocating and you can hear that in your stethoscope and or just lack of a standardized technique. So we found that you have to listen for a few breath cycles, listen as the heart rate speeds up and slows down as it does in dolphins with the breath, and it has to be quiet if there's a boat going by or a helicopter going by, all these noises that we're pretty used to in San Diego Bay, and you can easily miss these. And so training your ears to pick up on these really, really subtle murmurs and listening at different points in their heart rate speeding up and slowing down, that's how we were able to train ourselves to pick up on these really subtle murmurs that we hadn't previously been listening to. So we don't think that all of our animals just suddenly developed murmurs, but we were able to train our ears and get a better technique down pat so that we can actually pick up on these uh, more readily. But that's not all. That was basically just part one of our cardiac project. So part two was actually developing our advanced cardiac assessment techniques in the wild dolphins so that we can look for evidence of oil cardiotoxicity. So to do this, we wanted to refine the echocardiogram technique in dolphins. And again, an echocardiogram, I'm going to use that word a lot, or echo, is just a heart ultrasound. So we, our goal was to perform echoes in the wild dolphins in both Barataria Bay, so the oil dolphins, and Sarasota Bay, and also to look at ECG, or electrocardiogram recordings, that show us the heart rate and rhythm, and to look for any abnormalities there. And overall, the goal is to examine the cardiac health and survey for evidence of cardiotoxicity that could have been related to oil. So the same technique that I described before, we did full heart echocardiograms on Navy dolphins and wild dolphins to look at the rest of the heart. So not only look for what's causing the murmur, but also to look at the different sizes of the heart chambers, the different wall thicknesses, the blood flow velocity, um, to do a full look at their heart. And then ECG, we were able to utilize simultaneously to the rest of the dolphins exam by using these um, embedded silicone suction cup leads where we can put these on the dolphins in the water. And so they can wear this while we're doing the physical exam or while we're doing ultrasound. So this picture on the left is a wild dolphin during a health assessment that has these leads, uh, suction cup embedded leads on there. And then on the picture on the right is just an example. This is a trained Navy dolphin um, where we use the same technique. So just a better visualization of those suction cup embedded leads that we use. And we use uh, the similar placement that is used in horses because dolphins have a similar type of depolarization to their heart as horses, which is a little bit different than humans and dogs and cats. So for this part of our project, we were looking at what are the differences between the Barataria Bay dolphins and the Sarasota Bay dolphins? Do their hearts all look the same? Are there any abnormalities in those Barataria Bay dolphins that could be related to oil? And we did find a handful of really interesting cardiac abnormalities in the Barataria Bay dolphins. So first we noted that the Barataria Bay dolphins had thinner left ventricular walls. The left ventricle is basically the big part of the heart that pumps out blood to the aorta and the rest of the body. So it was a pretty important part. We found that their walls were thinner than the dolphins in Sarasota Bay. We also found that the Barataria Bay dolphins had smaller left atria. And the left atrium sits right above the left ventricle. It's what feeds that oxygenated blood into the left ventricle so that it can pump out to the rest of the body. And smaller left atria, we're still not entirely sure what this means, can be caused by things like anemia, um, but not all the Barataria Bay dolphins were anemic, can be caused um, by basically being dehydrated or volume underloaded, but not all of them had evidence of dehydration on their blood work. So we're still not entirely sure of the significance of this finding, but it was uh, significant compared to the Sarasota Bay dolphins. Also, the Barataria Bay dolphins had a higher prevalence, a significantly higher prevalence of valvular abnormalities. This included things like valve prolapse, which means the valve isn't opening and closing in the right way, and valve thickening, as well as leaky valves. And then most interesting to us was the finding that two dolphins in Barataria Bay, one of which was pretty young and one which was about middle age, they had pulmonary arterial hypertension. And that basically means high blood pressure in part of the heart. And no one had ever described this in a wild dolphin before. So this was really interesting to us. 
And one, the only study that we were able to find that had ever talked about pulmonary hypertension in a dolphin was from 1968, in which a managed care dolphin had basically a conglomeration of lungworms that was actually obstructing the pulmonary artery, and that was causing secondary pulmonary hypertension. So in these dolphins, we weren't able to see any evidence of a you know, huge conglomeration of lungworms in the pulmonary artery, but we think based on the possible mechanisms for pulmonary hypertension, one of the big ways that you can develop this disease is from chronic pulmonary disease. As I mentioned earlier, the dolphins in Barataria Bay, it's now very well documented over the last 10 years that they have a high prevalence of lung disease due to this oil exposure. So for this disease, it's possible either that the oil is causing direct cardiotoxic effects that's resulting in pulmonary hypertension or the oil is causing chronic pulmonary disease. And this basically leads to downstream changes that can result in arterial hypertension. So this again was a really interesting finding because no one had ever described it in wild dolphins before. Um, and we think this is probably related to the oil, but of course we've only seen it in two dolphins. No one else has described it. So more work is needed to really make that link of the oil and the pulmonary hypertension. And then I also mentioned that we did ECG. So we looked at over a thousand minutes of recording of ECG tracings from dolphins in Barataria and Sarasota. And we did find some arrhythmias in both of the groups, meaning abnormal heartbeats, um, but most of these were pretty benign. Uh, so it would be just you know, one here or there, like an early or ectopic beat or the occasional skipped beat or AV block. And we see this in our managed dolphins as well. And it's pretty common in horses and other, again, really athletic animals that dolphins are similar to, where if you have these beats just occasionally, it can be pretty normal. Um, and so none of the arrhythmias that we identified were life-threatening. Uh, they were all pretty benign arrhythmias and just occurred here or there, and were pretty similar across those two sites between Barataria and Sarasota. So as a summary, this was the first study examining the cardiac health of wild dolphins. So again, it seems like it's really basic, but this hadn't been done before. And of course, many years passed between the oil spill and our first examination of the heart health of these dolphins. So there's certainly you know, an imperfect gap there where we don't know what happened immediately after the spill to their hearts, or we only looked at it about eight years later. Um, so based on the studies from other animals, it seems like, the abnormalities that we saw can be related to oil. But of course, again, there's a big lapse in time. And so more work is needed to really follow the cardiac health of these animals. And if they wash up, unfortunately dead on shore to actually study them and see what their hearts look like um, after they've died and try to correlate that with the findings that we saw. So Barataria Bay dolphins in summary had substantial cardiac abnormalities. They had significantly different abnormalities that we didn't see in the other populations. Are these related to oil? We can propose mechanisms that can logically connect it to oil, but again, hard to definitively prove that yet, but it does fit with what's been shown in other species. Could it be due to chronic pulmonary disease from oil? Absolutely. Or could it be due to differences between populations? And so this is where we need to do more work. Dolphin cardiology has so much more where we need to learn so that we can clearly make these connections and these conclusions. We know that in other populations, for instance, humans who are elite rowers versus humans who are elite marathon runners, there are differences in their hearts due to those differences in exercise. So it's possible that the Sarasota Bay dolphins have a different normal than the Navy dolphins or than the Barataria dolphins because they all have different unique activity levels and lives that they lead. So we really need to get to the bottom of what is normal for a given population. Is that different for every population or is there a normal that applies to all dolphins? And we think based on our work so far that each population with its own unique activity level and lifestyle is going to have its own normal. And so it's really important to figure that out so that you can compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. And I don't like to end on a Debbie Downer note. So I included this quote so that you don't all go home sad that the dolphins are all dying from oil and they all have cardiac disease. So I wanna end on an uplifting note. And I love this quote that is actually from our website 
for Mother Teresa that we ourselves feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean, but the ocean would be less because of that missing drop. So just to hammer home that everything we do matters. So even though I personally can't go plug the oil spill, you personally can't go stop oil drilling, everything we do does matter and can lead to significant change if we all do it together. So even the simple things, eating less meat, riding your bike instead of driving your car, using less plastic, being a better steward of the earth and of the ocean, you know, all of these things can lead to bigger, more profound impacts if we all take a pledge to ourselves to do it together. So that's my uplifting note to end on so that we don't all go home sad. <laughs> And I'd like to thank everyone who's involved in uh, this whole project. So the cardiology team from San Diego Veterinary Cardiology, of course, all the people from the US Navy Marine Mammal Program and the National Marine Mammal Foundation, including the wonderful vet techs, other veterinarians, the research support staff, and the animal care and training staff. And of course, the wonderful field work teams, because it takes a huge team to accomplish this work. And then of course, to our education and outreach team, to Brittany and Adriana and Celeste for putting on this wonderful webinar series. And again, this huge collaborative effort due to all of these people listed here, we couldn't have done it alone. So it was a really great collaboration between all these organizations. Thank you so much for joining today and for listening. And I will turn it back over to Brittany. Yes, uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, if you liked this presentation, want to learn a bit more about Dr. Linehan's work or other work that the National Marine Mammal Foundation is doing, please um, share the National Marine Mammal Foundation's miss mission and message with your friends. Um, you can visit us at nmmf.org and then also follow us on social media, Facebook and Instagram. Um, you can also scan that QR code as well. Um, if you guys are interested, we are a nonprofit organization. So if you are interested in donating to the dolphin project in the Gulf of Mexico, the National Marine Mammal Foundation in general, our education and outreach efforts, et cetera, um, you can visit our website as well. That's all there. Um, Adriana will put that in the chat. And finally, um, Barbara, if you could just click to the next slide for me, we wanted to let you guys know we are really excited. So we are actually team, teaming up with the Office of Naval Research uh, Undersea Medicine Program to offer this workshop coming up later this month. This is SEAL to SEAL. So it's kind of looking at the diving adaptations of marine mammals, but then we'll also have the opportunity to talk to a few Navy SEALs, learn about um, human, human diving as opposed to marine mammal diving and things like that. So um, registration for that is on our website, um, nmmf.org slash participate. It was open to people of all ages, so please come join us. We are very, very excited about that. And uh, we are going to open the floor to questions. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat and then I will get them answered for you. Um, but to start, Barb, we did have a few. Um, so the first question I have for you is, what is the difference with Deepwater Horizon oil spill compared to other oil spills? Kind of what, what was the difference there? Yeah, great question. And the basic answer is that the Deepwater Horizon oil spill was huge. So there are lots of small oil spills that unfortunately are happening all the time that we don't even hear about. They don't even make the news because it's pretty commonplace. So the real difference with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill is that it was massive, that massive, massive scale, 87 days, 200 million gallons of oil. Um, so it was just really impactful to the miles and miles and miles of coastline where all of that oil washed ashore. And of course, the, the Northern Gulf of Mexico is home to lots of animals, including endangered animals like sea turtles and giant bluefin tuna. Um, so the species that it impacted were also some sort of high profile species. And so a lot of attention was paid to try and assess the impacts. The government basically brought in these teams to assess the impacts um, that led to some uh, legislation, not legislation, uh, some legal uh, discourse to try to figure out if BP was responsible for all of the impacts of this. So the types of oil can also be different, but uh, the magnitude of this oil spill, I think, is what really set it apart from other oil spills um, that unfortunately happen all of the time. Great. Thank you so much for addressing that. Um, yeah, there was an oil spill that just happened there recently. So oil spills have been at the 
forefront of everyone's attention at the moment, unfortunately. So um, thank you for asking that wonderful question. Um, you had also mentioned that there were impacts noted in other species like birds and fish and even people. And mm -hmm. so someone had asked, I, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this because I know marine mammals are kind of your forte, <laughs> but um, what lesions were noted in other species as a result of the cardiotoxic effects from exposure to deep water horizon oil? If yeah, you know. that's a great question. So I can't speak to all of the turtle work or all of the bird work, but specifically the cardiac effects I can speak to a little bit. Um, so in the shorebirds, basically in several different types of birds, including cormorants, um, they were actually able to ultrasound their hearts and show as well with necropsy, they were able to show that they had essentially thinner walls like we saw in the dolphins. And basically their heart wasn't contracting the way it should. And then in the rats, they were able to take deep water horizon oil, apply it to these rats in a lab setting, and they showed that it impacted the hearts acutely. So it happened right away. And then some of them didn't even have the impacts later in life. So that's why it's really interesting when they looked weeks later, the effects were gone. It's interesting to us, we will never know, unfortunately, what happened immediately after the oil spill to these hearts. And we know a lot of the animals died and it's possible they died from those initial acute effects of oil causing direct cardiotoxicity. And then maybe the animals who survived had basically a sublethal dose. So they were able to kind of overcome it, but their hearts were worse for wear. Um, and so that's kind of what parallels that rat study where some of the rats had really bad immediate effects, but then they were able to survive. And when they looked at them down the road, um, they some of those are, effects were actually reversible. On um, the human study, there are about four papers now that have come out from a group who has examined the people who lived in close proximity to the oil spill, so basically lived on shore where the oil was washing ashore, um, and the people who helped clean up the oil spill. And they've been able to show that compared to a normal human population, they have way higher risk of heart abnormalities, including ECG abnormalities and even heart attacks. And they've followed those people now. It's called the Gulf Study, if you want to look it up. It's really fascinating and really sad. Um, even seven years after the oil spill, they followed up with those people and shown that they're still seeing effects like ECG abnormalities, changes on their heart ultrasounds, and risk of heart attacks. A lot of them are, have experienced heart attacks in the seven years since the oil spill, and not necessarily all right after. Some of them uh, were in years later, um, but compared to a normal population, they've been able to show that these people who were healthy before are now having these heart effects. Um, and so they're saying that is directly linked to the oil exposure. So yeah, again, I, I see Cynthia and Forrester on, so if they want to comment on some of the other impacts that we've seen, we can certainly touch on that. But yeah, for the cardiac impacts, um, we've seen pretty similar things in other species to what we're seeing in the dolphins. And there are other previous studies that have shown uh, direct cardiotoxic effects of oil in other animals like cows and sheep who they obviously don't live in the ocean but they have been exposed to oil basically when there's an oil spill that uh, involves like a well or a pipe and the animals drink the, the oil in that area or accidentally ingest it. Um, it's also been shown that they have thin kind of flabby hearts that don't contract as well. So it seems across all of these different species that the oil impacts them similarly and causes these significant abnormalities. Thanks, great Barbara. Question. And I, yeah, and I think that's great. I'm glad you knew. I was like, oh, I don't know, Dr. Barb's a dolphin vet, but um, we do it all. <laughs> yeah, that's really important to note too, is that, you know, um, this oil spill happened in 2010 and we're still seeing impacts from not only dolphins, but people too. And so that kind of, I kind of want everyone to take that away today too, is that it's why it's so important to advocate for, um, you know, renewable resources and things like that, because when these oil spill happens, it's not like you just clean up the spill and walk away, right? If you can even clean it up, it's, it's long lasting effects that potentially wipe out entire populations of animals and, you know, affect people as well. So thank you for touching on that. Um, I know we do have a few veterinarians in the audience, so we have a few more um, medicine-oriented questions, but one of the questions that came in was, um, did you find evidence for conscious control of heart rate in dolphins? 
And then to pair on that question, um, Jason also wanted to know what kind of ECG are you using? And asked if it's obtainable in the wild, but I, I think he means like, is that obtainable just on the market in general or, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the ECG that we were using in the field was the Televet 100. And so that's a commercially available product. We then take it, we take the leads and we put them in those silicone suction cups that we just make in house. Um, so that it basically just helps waterproof it so that there's not so much interference from salt water when the animals are wearing it in the water. Um, and then we, the picture that I had of the Navy dolphin who's wearing the suction cups, that's using a product called Vet ECG that's made by a company called Dextronics. It's the same exact thing, basically, um, just a little different software. And in terms of the heart rate, so we did see in all of the animals that we looked at in the wild, and we see it every day in our Navy animals, it's normal for dolphins to have a respiratory sinus arrhythmia, meaning their heart rate speeds up after a breath and then it slows down. And then they take a breath and it speeds up again and it slows down. And this is related um, to the interplay of basically vagal tone. So sympathetic drive and parasympathetic drive um, and as part of the diving response. So we um, saw that in all of the animals in Barataria Bay and Sarasota Bay. We did see uh, that the dolphins in Barataria Bay tended to have a smaller difference in their highest heart rate and lowest heart rate. And we attribute that to the fact that they're probably slightly stressed out when we're handling them. So of course, when we're handling them, we are monitoring their physiologic parameters, their ECG, uh, their heart rate, the way they're behaving, their respiratory rate and everything to make sure we're not stressing them out uh, you know, to a bad point. But of course, any wild animal that's caught temporarily, they're a little bit stressed out versus let's say the Navy dolphins who are trained to sit there, we listen to them, we do the ECG, they know they're getting fish, they're trained for these husbandry behaviors, they're really used to it. So they're a little more relaxed. And so we did note that a significant difference between the heart rates between those two groups where the Navy dolphins had generally lower heart rates with a bigger split, meaning lower heart rates after the breath and even a little bit lower um, following the breath compared to those wild dolphins who tended to have a smaller range where their heart rate was going up and down and overall it was a little bit higher. But yeah, so we did see um, some differences in the heart rate between the populations and our study didn't look specifically at the voluntary control, but I know um, Andreas Fallman has done a lot of work on that topic and has shown, yeah, some uh, voluntary control over heart rate. Yeah, thank yes. you for that great question. Um, yeah, it was a great question. There is no doubt they are fascinating to say the least for multiple reasons. Um, another more medicine oriented question someone had asked, uh, do you have a breakdown of murmur grades? Curious what grade murmurs would be caused by high velocity outflow. And um, the person who submitted this question said would suspect grade two or less. Yeah, great, great question. Um, and in our paper, we do have a whole breakdown. Um, if you want all the nitty gritty on it, um, you can, I can, we can even put the link to the paper in the chat probably. Um, but yeah, most of the murmurs that we heard, we classified them as dynamic, meaning it wasn't always even the same grade of murmur. Sometimes it was quieter and sometimes it was louder with that respiratory arrhythmia, meaning the heart rate slowed up and slowed down and it was louder when the heart rate sped up. But most of the dolphins had very low grade murmurs. So they would range from anywhere from zero to one. Um, I think we only heard one grade three. So most of them were zero, one, and two. And that is basically in line with what's been described in those other athletic species that I mentioned. So the racing um, animals, race horses, athletic people, the greyhounds and the sled dogs, where most of the animals with athletic innocent murmurs, they're very low grade. Awesome, thank you. And for those of you that are interested in reading about this project a little more in depth, Thank you, Dr. Barrett Claw, who just dropped the link to the paper in the chat. So um, if you guys have questions, you know, for example, the grade of murmurs and things like that, as Dr. Linehan had mentioned, it is all in that paper. And so Dr. Barrett Claw very graciously put it in the chat for us. So thank you. Thank you. And I should um, mention the uh, part two we have submitted for publication. So hopefully you'll be able to read the nitty gritty of that one uh, shortly in a journal near you in a journal near you. Perfect. Um, let's see, we had one, one more question come in here from Juan. Um, 
Could pulmonary hypertrophy be linked to increased pulmonary blood requirements when dolphins are handled? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I can't say definitively no, but I will say that we didn't see it in any other dolphins at any other time when they're being handled. So I would think if that was, you know, across the board when they're being handled and they have increased oxygen because they're maybe they're having a little sympathetic drive they're in the fight or flight response. Um, I would think that we would see that in more of them. And we don't, we didn't see this in any of the Sarasota Bay dolphins. And we didn't see this even in any of the other Barataria Bay dolphins. And we definitely, um, you know, are not seeing this on a routine basis in the Navy dolphins. So there are similar in humans with pulmonary hypertension, the WHO has basically all of these different categories for the causes of pulmonary hypertension. And so that includes things like chronic pulmonary disease, toxins. Of course, one of the, one of the uh, categories is we don't know. <laughs> so me, uh, that is always applicable to veterinary medicine. Sometimes we just don't know. Um, but in line with what is seen in other species, uh, for these two animals, the things that made the most sense were the chronic pulmonary disease, which basically causes increased vascular resistance, so changes in the, the veins, essentially, um, that are coming back into the heart and cause changing the pressure of that side of the heart. And then that results in the changes that we're able to actually measure with the ultrasound. So again, can't say definitively no, no that's a fantastic question. Um, that of course requires more studying for us to be able to say yes or no. Um, but it seems like this was actually a pathologic thing, not just due to us handling them. Great, thank you. And yeah, please keep that in mind if you do look a bit more into the paper, remember that um, there, there were dolphin populations that were observed that weren't impacted by the oil. So mm -hmm. um, we did control for that as well. So yeah. um, great, that was all the questions I had in the chat that you had not addressed already. So, um, we do have 10 more minutes. If anyone has any other questions, please put them in the chat. Otherwise, we will wrap up a few minutes early, but I do want to say thank you so much to Dr. Linehan. She is volunteering her time today to be here and share this with all of you. And so we are so grateful to her and all of the other scientists at the foundation who have dedicated their time to um, this scientific snapshot series. And again, if you are interested in that seal to seal workshop that is happening to weekends from now on the 24th, I believe it's on Saturday. Um, please go ahead and head over to our website. And uh, that's, that's all we got for you. So we'll hang out for a little bit. And uh, thank you guys so much. If you have any additional questions that we didn't get to, uh, please go ahead and email us at outreach at nmmf.org. And we will work our best to uh, get those addressed for you. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Brittany.